So, you know, as always, it's just a privilege to be able to bring the gospel, you know, um, to, uh, to all of you. It's certainly an honor uh, that, you know, in and of myself, I'm not worthy of. But because of Christ Jesus, he has made me worthy. And so I cherish it. And um, I'm going to speak to you today about <laughs> what the scripture says ought not to be in the church. And um, that's quarreling. Um, and over the years, you know, I've seen this happen in uh, our previous church and in here. And, um, you know, it doesn't bear good fruit. And um, it's quite interesting what the scriptures have to say about it. And, of course, there's a solution to it, and, and I'll get to that. So in 2 Timothy 2, uh, 23 through 26... Um, I'm going to pause for that because i got to share with you something that was shared for me before I came up here. And see these orange background, the papers and the, and the uh, whatever you call the placards or whatever, hanging on them. That was just solid orange. Well, a dear saint in the church thought it needed a little dressing up and she put all the lines and the dots, those circles, painted them by hand to bless you all to make it look more attractive. And uh, man, that's because she loves Jesus. Because boy, that's the only way I'd do that. I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> so anyhow, I just wanted to recognize her. She didn't do it to be recognized, but we're to honor those that honor the Lord. And so I just wanted to mention that. So 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. So church, we're admonished to not be a part of that. And it goes on to say in verse 25, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Boy, there is a lot to ponder there. I mean, we go from quarreling to doing the will of the devil. That's you and me. That's a big deal. So we need to be um, really uh, conscious of that. In Matthew 5, 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Gets there pretty quick. <laughs> Matthew 5, 20. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And no, I'm sorry. So anyhow, that ends again. You fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So we see that foolish and ignorance all originates from quarreling. It's an honor, Proverbs 23, it's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. But every fool will be quarreling. So church, don't be a fool. Ignorance. 1 Peter 1, 14-16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he called you, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, 
come to your senses. Escape the snare of the devil so you don't do his will. Proverbs 18, 9. A trap seizes him by the heel. A snare lays hold of him. So the snare has him by the heel and has total control and direction and, and controls the direction that he's going in. It's the cowboy healing the steer. Once he does that, he has total control. And he gets headed by another cowboy and becomes stretched out and is totally immobilized. No control over his body at all. So what a picture of what the scripture is trying to show us. So, so in that setting, we lose control and the freedom to live like Christ. Proverbs 18, 7. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Now, church, this might sound, sound like a little bit of a beating, but it's not. It's to encourage you and to recognize, like I have on many occasions where I've entered into that. So, a fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. So as an early Christian at the church uh, I was attending, we had an awesome worship leader. I mean, the guy was just really good, and he had good people around him, and we just worshiped the Lord. Well, after one service, I told him he wasn't very good. Holy smokes, can you believe that? I mean, a guy that can't, you know, can only sing in the shower, can't hold a tune in a bucket, whatever that means, but it's a saying we have. You know what I... What I mean, it's just not any good. And so when I went home, man, I was immediately convicted of what I had just done and called him and apologized and asked for his forgiveness. Glad to say, by God's grace, we're still friends to this day. Great man of God and his wife and family. Um, so um, that day and several since, my foolish mouth has been my ruin. And sad to say, church, especially with my wife. But by his grace and the faithful wound of a friend, Marty Davis, I was able to love my wife like Christ loves the church. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry. For anger lodges in the hearts of fools. There we go again. So that's you and me. And we've all been there and thinking that at the time, or at least I was, that I was so right, man, so righteous. You know, I got it. I'll get it straightened out. I'll get you straightened out too. Just, just, just listen. <laughs> But actually, so wrong and being played like a fiddle, snared by her enemy. So the snare in our soul encourages us to have our own way. It's that I want, I want, I want, I want. And on and on it goes. Um, Paul Tripp wrote a book about marriage and said, What did you expect? <laughs> Powerful book. If you are married or getting married, read the book. I mean, it's just eye-opening. Uh, helped my marriage tremendously because it helped me repent. So, uh, a good book. <clears throat> so, the snare entices us to have our own way. The I want syndrome. Just like the devil demanded at the fall. You know, he wanted it his way. And church, you know, we have naturally inherited his traits. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. When the Bible says that we are snared into doing his will, it's the devil's will, not our father's will. Church, do you know how fast we went from quarreling to doing the devil's will? Look at it, I'm going to snap my finger you know, I'm going to have you snap your fingers after I count to three so here we go one, two, three 
That's how fast it is. And uh, you know what? I love to hear that because guess what? I cannot do that. <laughs> I have practiced and tried. I just don't have it, you know. So I love it when others can. Bob can pop your ears by snapping his fingers, you know. Not me. You don't even hear it. So, uh, anyhow, you know, you get the picture. The snap, snapshot, if you will. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 23-26. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil themselves, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Proverbs 30, 33, for pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood. Think about that one, that's like a big ouch. And pressing anger produces strife, so it's painful. This quarreling ends up in painful strife. So, it's better to live in the corner of the housetop than, than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> Amen. No. So, <laughs> forgive me, Lord. So, anyhow, <coughs> uh, you know, so this isn't picking on a wife's church, but it shows the gravity of quarreling. You know, it's, the Bible says it ought not to be so. Proverbs 19, 13. I didn't know that the scripture had so much about quarreling. Man, there's a load of it here. I just love it. So, Proverbs 19, 13. A foolish son is ruined to his father, and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. It's just nauseating. It's, it's ugly. We haven't, it has no place in the church. It ought not to be. And again, I'm not picking on our wives. It's the same with a quarreling man. It's like enough already. I'm sick of hearing it. It produces no fruit. and it stir, Instead, it stirs up strife. Produces separation and causes our prayers to be hindered, as does quarreling. Think about it. Not pretty and results in, among other things, hindered prayer. We are actually quarreling with our groom, the risen Christ who lives in the one you're quarreling with. Get a picture of it, church. Get a picture of it. So when a man and a wife are quarreling, their prayers are hindered, and so are ours when we quarrel with one another. You know, hindered prayer is not... Good, you know, it's a waste of time, church. Proverbs 23 It's an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool, there we go again, every fool will be quarreling. From honor to quarreling in the snap of a finger. You're quarreling, you're a fool. How's that taste? We would all rather taste and see that the Lord is good. Proverbs 15, 18, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Patience is a gift to us by our Lord, enabling us to calm a quarrel, calm a quarrel, and love one another. So, you know, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It gives me goosebumps as I read that. Ever seen a goose's skin? Them are real goosebumps. I don't think gooses is the proper words, but you, you get the point. I don't know what they call plural geese, but anyhow, I call them gooses. So, <laughs> uh, 
again, uh, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So let's chew on that a little bit. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So we go from zero to 60, falling into the snare of the devil faster than any exotic sports car. Man, you are just there. Boom. James 2, 2 through 9. Taming the time. That's the title. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. So if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. Listen to this, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. You know, when I stain uh, a new shirt, you know, it messes up the whole shirt. <laughs> and I just know that everyone is staring at it. Everyone is focused on the stain, not on the purity of God. So that's what we do. We present the stain, not the purity of God that is put inside of you by the power of the Spirit, the same, the same power that rose Christ Jesus from the dead. That's inside of you. So... Every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So when we do that, we're, we're defaming those who are made in the likeness of God. We need to know that. We need to realize that. So, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, just full of deadly poison. So... You know, we bless the Lord and Father, and then we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So let's take a look at what happens, uh, or what happened in the desert in the Old Testament. Grumbling, quarreling with Moses for bringing them out there to die. They were longing for the leeks and onions and the brick making that entrapped us in Egypt. So who is Moses? Well, he's a son of God called by him to lead his people into the land of milk and honey, just as God had promised a blessing, a place of rest and peace, protection from their enemies, you know, a place of freedom. Who would not desire that? And that's what God brought them there to walk in and experience. 
And yet they grumbled and stumbled around for 40 years until an entire generation died. You know, what a waste of time because of their unbelief and refusal to submit to God's will. And it was a blessing, staring them right in the face. And they said, we don't want it. We want to go back where we were. Our quarreling and rebellion, you know, affects all those around us. It did away with an entire generation, church. It wasn't just the persons or persons that were quarreling. It affected the whole church. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we've got to, got to understand these things. The Bible says these things ought not to be. Numbers 14, 28 to 35. How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? See, when we're grumbling, right, we're grumbling, we're grumbling against God. I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness. Church, our bodies are dead because of quarreling. And of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one should come into the land where I swore that I'd make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years, and shall suffer for your faithfulness, unfaithfulness, or faithlessness. There we go. Until the last of your dead bodies lie in the wilderness, according to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days a year for each day you shall bear iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure I the Lord have spoken surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation strong words church who are gathered together against me in the wilderness they shall come to a full end and there they shall die. We don't want to be part of that wilderness. God uses the wilderness, right, to get our attention. But we don't want to be part of this wilderness where we end up dead. So how many days have you quarreled? By his grace, I'm thankful that I don't have to bear, that I don't have to bear my iniquity for each day that I quarreled. And I'm thankful that he does not count my iniquities against me. Amen? Amen? Amen. Grumbling and quarreling affect the fruit of our loins, our kids and grandkids. It's not just us, but it pollutes our legacy, our offspring, your offspring. Sin and rebellion spread like wildfire. Grumbling and quarreling, they shall die. James 3.10, taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, I've gone over this, but I, I need to do it again. Paul did that every once in a while. We need to get it. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble, what he says, he's a perfect man, he will also to bridle his whole body. If we put uh, bits into the mouth, uh, mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are very large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. We love that, church said to say. And again, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire 
and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not to be so. So how is this straightened out or rectified? How is it turned around to produce good fruit, resulting in life that glorifies our Father in heaven? Luke 6, 43, 45, a tree and its fruit. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruits. I know you hear this over and over again. But we need to really take it in. And by the power of the Spirit, live this truth out. So uh, figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil Treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance, the heart of the heart, his mouth speaks. So speak patience, church. Do not grumble and quarrel with one another. James 5, 14 through 16. But if you have bitter jealousy, jealous, see, <laughs> and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and listen to this, demonic. My goodness. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Those are strong words. Oh my goodness. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In Titus 1.5, it's one of my favorite scriptures, I'm sorry, it's Titus 1.15. It says, to the pure, all things are pure. So, church, as we deal with our brothers and sisters, we need to see the purity that God has freely given them. Blessed are the peacemakers, Matthew 5, 9, for they shall be called sons of God. So peacemakers, sons of God. How do you and I become peacemakers and sons of God? The Bible says that all of us wanted nothing to do with God. The Bible says, look at, we didn't choose him, he chose us. The heart of our fathers that none would perish, but all would be saved. Amen. We all must be born again, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power God used to raise Christ Jesus from the dead, from death to life. As Pastor Bob has taught us that we must submit to Christ's finished work on the cross, he used the word hupomeno. Come under the mission of our Savior, submission, submerged. Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, don't marvel that I said you must be born again because that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So you must be born again. So, born in the spirit instead of quarreling 
and complaining. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. All has become new. You know, church, he didn't dust off the old. He created us a new. He made us a new. He, didn't, he made you different. He just didn't dust you off and clean you up, put a new unstained shirt on you, although that is a good picture. But he changed you. He made you a new man, a new woman. So in Romans 12, 3, another favorite verse, it says he made us anew by changing the way we think. New Agers think they figured this out, but Jesus proclaimed this truth long before they did. You must be born again of the Spirit. As new creations, we will not demand our way, I want, I want, I want. <clears throat> or at least we'll recognize it when we do. 1 Timothy 6, 2 through 8. Two, three, eight, through eight. <laughs> Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and listen to this. And for quarrels about words that produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depraved of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So church contentment swallows us up strife and quarreling. And God gives that to us if we will receive it. So quarrels produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction, friction among people who are depraved of the truth. <laughs> Imagining that godliness is a means of great gain. Well, that's not a bucket list that we want to fulfill. So we must be known by him and we must know him. Jesus said that the judgment, at the judgment, he will separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats will state that they did all these good works in his name. But Jesus will say, depart from me because I never knew you. So church, we have fallen into the snare of the devil in our walk with our Lord. Saying with Paul that the good I desired to do... I did not do, but did the bad that I didn't want to do. So we all fall short of the glory of the Lord. That's why the Bible says, ye must be born again, living in the power of the Spirit. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Are you holy? Church, we are holy because of our Father's endless mercy and grace that he has lavished upon us in Christ Jesus. So do you know him? Well, in ending, I hope this sheds up some light on quarreling in church and its widespread effects in our lives and the lives of those around us. And at least that we will recognize it when we fall into the snare of the devil. You know, and, and also how it takes up the time of our pastors and staff. So as we prepare for communion, we're going to listen to a, a recording of a man who knew him and encouraged all of us to know him. Oh, I wish I could describe him to you. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. 
He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's Son. He's a sinner's Savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king.